What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with... It sounds sort of simple in a way, and it turns out that is underlies much of science. That uh, they are trying to answer that question. How do things change when you change the scale of the system? Jeffrey West is a physicist turned complexity theorist. He is currently a distinguished professor at the Santa Fe Institute, where he served as president from 2005 to 2009. West has been listed as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. He is the author of Scale, The Universal Laws of Growth, Innovation, Sustainability, and the Pace of Life in Organisms, Cities, Economies, and Companies. In his book, Scale, which Sean absolutely loves, Jeffrey became fascinated by aging and mortality and applied the rigor of a physicist to the biological question of why we live as long as we do and no longer. The result was astonishing and changed science. West found that despite the massive diversity in animals, they are all, to a large degree, scaled versions of each other. If you know the size of a mammal, you can use scaling laws to learn everything from how much food it eats per day, what its heart rate is, how long it will take to mature, its lifespan, and so on. This conversation is certainly going to expand your thinking. Jeffrey West, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you, and uh, nice to see you and meet you, Sean, and thank Get you for it. inviting me to your podcast. Of course, this is a true honor. So I actually came across your book, Scale, um, from a past guest, Michael Mobison, and, and he couldn't recommend oh. it enough. And, and so when, when Michael recommends a book, uh, he's a voracious reader, um, and he says this one really yes. intrigued him, uh, and I dove into it. I was just all over it, so this, this is such an honor. But I, I'm always intrigued about people who sustain excellence or do interesting things in their lives, what their backstory was like, and you have a really interesting one. Uh, I heard that your mom dropped out of school by the time she was 13, and your father was a gambler. Any lessons you learned from your father being a gambler that stuck with you throughout life? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, in, I think the lesson was, and maybe I react, I overreacted, was uh, because he was a gambler. So, and uh, for most of my growing up years, um, it meant that our um, financial fortunes uh, were how shall I put it, unstable. <laughs> um, so, um, and uh, that often caused a lot of stress in the family, obviously. And so my, I, the lesson I learned um, was to be probably more cautious than I need a bit. That is not to go that route, that I would, that the, that I would not go the route of, um, uh, basing my life on on extreme risk, where there is no fundamental basis. You know, I mean, that is that. Of course, my father would argue that uh, he studied uh, quite seriously, and he was an extraordinarily smart man, by the way. But he would seriously study, you know, horses and dogs, and he would understand card games and so on. But nevertheless, I felt that. Um, uh, you know, for me, a steady job was going to be the way I was going to make my living. Um, so uh, that that introduced me to a much more cautious way than I maybe should have been for the rest of my career, because I think it took me quite a while to feel that um, it's okay to sort of go outside of the box. And indeed, you know, much of my later career has done that. But it took me quite a while to feel comfortable with that. I was going to ask you but about it. But it stood me in good stead. But having said that, it did stay, going to your question, it actually stood me in very good stead, actually, in keeping um, a kind of stable vision of what I wanted to do. Yeah, I was going to ask you how you handle risk, because you mentioned your, your career risk and, and you wanted to go down kind of, kind of a more conservative-esque path, but then later in your career, what you were doing within your field and even outside of your field, it seems like somewhat risky. So I would love yeah. to just hear, you, hear your thoughts around risk. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I've ever completely come to terms with it um, because um, none of us really do, of course. Um, uh, but, um, and, and it's an intuitive judgment, obviously, in the end. Um, as to how much risk should one take. And I think uh, one of the things I have learned since then is being risk averse 
is somehow much worse in quotes this is a judgment statement of course than being always safe mm -hmm. it's a bit like you know er, what is it early to bed early to rise makes jack healthy wealthy and boring so um <laughs> you know, it's a bit like that you know i mean if you, you've got one life and eventually it, it becomes clear to you you only have one life it's not uh, you know we're not practicing for anything this is it and at some stage you you know you have to decide what it is that you want out of it um what you want to gain why you're here um, um what you want to contribute um and and i think um the for me the recognition that stepping outside of the canonical boundaries um was became more and more important hmm. and uh, in order to feel that i was living i mean that was just for me indeed i don't I don't profess that that should be true for other people necessarily, but for me, who had been quite conservative in the early part of my life, um, this was um, refreshing, and it was like a little bit, not exactly throwing off the shackles, but um, it was um, very liberating in many ways. And uh, I began to realize that that was what I had missed early on in my career. And, and surprisingly, way because you know most of my early career was in high energy physics, you know, quarks and gluons and the early universe and so on. And um, I think I would have been more successful in that. Not that I wasn't. I was successful to some extent, of course. But um, I would have been more successful had I been um, a little less risk averse in allowing myself to follow pathways where I would soon think, ah. No, that's just too crazy, and everybody's going to laugh at me and say, you know, Jeffrey West's a complete idiot, and so on. He's gone off the rocker, and um, you know, and I was very much ha hampered by that. Well, I, the, the ones around me like call me an idiot at least twelve times a week, so we, we, yeah, we can both identify with that. I, I am yeah, wondering though, sure. you mentioned just finally feeling comfortable taking off the shackles. Um, was, was there a specific moment that led to this or was this just a, a gradual thing you felt more comfortable within your career? No, it was gradual. I would say it was gradual. It was definitely gradual um, and uh, almost serendipitous, but it happened, um, you know, in spite of myself, so to speak. You know, it, it, uh, it, it was one of those cases where you could ascribe it to the mis mysteries of the unconscious. You know, this, this, uh, I mean, I don't, it, this, this image of oneself, that there's the conscious self and then this other bit that is sort of helping to drive the system and uh, which you're not so aware of. And uh, somehow that part was wiser than the conscious part in retrospect. <laughs> I'm actually really intrigued by this, the mysteries of the unconscious. Is this something that, that you actively think about or at least even try to tap into at times? Yes, in some ways um, I do. I'm, I'm uh, um, I've always been intrigued by the psyche, by you know the mind, consciousness, and so forth, as I'm sure most of us are in some form or another. Um, and uh, part of that has been enhanced because I'm married to, and have been married for a very long time, to a woman who has is a Jungian psychoanalyst, and uh, <laughs> so she's very much that way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, I've, we, we have interesting uh, arguments and argument discussions <laughs> about these questions. Um, and, uh, but um, yes, I, I, I recognize the role of the unconscious and, um, and, and, and I'm very open to allowing in, intuition to play a role. You know, I mean, for example, um, you know, we're all familiar with this in a way, you know, you, sometimes you have big decisions in your life, what job to take, uh, do you want to make a move or uh, whatever, buying a house, I don't know. And, and what I have discovered, especially the big decisions, as distinct from the smaller decisions, is that I am, you know, since I'm a physicist, mathematical physicist by training, I, I study um, the details of the problem, whatever it is, and I sort of I had to do the pluses and minuses, the costs and the benefits, and I work it all out. And on small matters, like um, buying even 
this bottle of ink, I will spend a lot of time figuring out what is the best. And then I'll make the decision based on that. But when it comes to the big decisions, one of the things I've realized in my life is that yes, I do all that, but when I actually make the decision, it turns out to be my intuition, my unconscious that I allow to come through. And often it's one that is at odds with these, um, I'll call them calculations, if you like, the kind of analytic way of thinking. Um, and that has, and, and what I've discovered in my life is that that has actually stood me in good stead, even though, and this goes to the risk question, by the way, even though in doing so, one often feels, oh my God, what did I do? That was really stupid. It's obviously not the right decision. A kind of a, a little bit of buyer's remorse feeling. And then just saying, then shrugging my shoulders and saying, I'm sure it'll work out okay. And I would say in, in almost all the major decisions of my life, that has proved to be um, the case. So, and I, there's no formula for that, of course. I mean, and so it's, it's hard to, um, you know, it, it's hard to make that more articulate than saying that it is intuition is and the unconscious at work. Do you Whatever think that means. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do you think your conviction in the unconscious has gone up over time after some of these decisions you said that at first you had that pit in your stomach feeling and they, they turned out to be better and that's why you have more conviction towards it now? Well, it, it's, it's also related to something else that I think many scientists and well others, other thinkers, so to speak, um, uh, experience. And that is... Um, that you know, when you're grappling with a problem, especially conceptually grappling and trying to solve a problem, um, very often uh, the solution sort of seems to come out of the blue. I mean, you grapple with it and grapple, and then you know, either you wake up one morning and there it is, or you're going on a nice hike, and then suddenly, boing, it pops into your head, into your consciousness, and it becomes, it's very clear that some process has been going on um, that you're not immediately conscious of where the brain, the, 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 the multiple neural impulses and uh, uh, the, the, the structure of the neural network, I don't know, has been operating um, and on, on still working on this issue, on these issues in a way that is very hard sometimes to get to consciously. So I've had that experience many times and I and certainly colleagues and friends have had similar experiences. So there is something going on there which is extremely hard to identify. And of course it brings to the fore the big question of of course, what is consciousness and of course the structure of the brain and how does it work and what is thinking and what is mind and all these other big questions about which I don't have very much more to say to be honest even though no, I think about it. <laughs> no, no, I, I always love hearing people who, who I believe to have interesting thoughts articulate certain ideas like this. So thanks for, for entertaining me there. We, yeah. we started off asking about your father and I'm actually really intrigued about you as a father because your son Joshua actually ended up meddling as a rower in the Olympics, correct? Yes. What's something that you learned from Joshua then about elite performance at the highest level? Oh, gosh, that's an interesting question too. Uh, yes, uh, so yes, it's quite surprising really because um, I'm not, uh, neither myself nor my wife are athletes in the you know, sort of more professional sense of that word. Uh, she certainly wasn't. I was very sporty as a young man and my fantasies were, the, you know, my fantasy world beyond you know sexual activities was to do with sports you know that i would become a great football player or whatever and and i was good at sports but i was never you know never beyond good i could make it make the team but so so sports was there um and our son joshua um was uh, was extreme was very tall for his age and um one of the great, and that, that meant that um, he was relatively uncoordinated. Um, you know, he was sort of too big for his body relative to the kids of his same age. And this was a, you know, I think it was quite, it was amazing watching him um, 
adapt to that in trying to play sports that, that he could work on. And, and, you know, he, so playing soccer or I don't know, he played hockey, for example, were always rather difficult because he was too big in a way. I mean, <laughs> but when he went to college, he decided that uh, given that, given his size, tall and thin, he would try out rowing. And to cut a very long story short, um, he dedicated himself to rowing and became an Olympic silver medalist, not a gold medalist, but a silver medalist, by, by one inch, by the way. <laughs> so, which, which is also an interesting lesson because to, um, uh, you know, to accept that, to accept, you know, that you didn't get the, the first prize, the gold medal by, you know, a, almost a fluctuation, you know, the boats are going like this, and, you know, which way. So it, it's hard and to see him accept that was also, uh, you know, quite, quite extraordinary and not, uh, not let it sort of, you know, weigh too heavily on him. But the, going back to his adapting to that sport, was that the dedication was extraordinary. And it was particularly extraordinary. It was in college, but even more so when he was a graduate student, because at the Olympic level, um, everybody's effectively a professional. So the crew, everybody in the crew, that's all they did was row, meaning that there were six hours of intensive training a day and rowing is considered the most intense of all sports, actually, because it's a full body sport. Um, and the um, uh, amount of the, your metabolism is the highest of any sport, possibly with the exception or equally so with um, cross country skiing, interestingly enough. But um, so there was this extraordinary dedication to that. But he was a graduate student at the same time doing his PhD. And um, he was then running a lab. And so he would get up, you know, at six in the morning, go and had to drive um, about 40 minutes to the training place, uh, go on the river, train, go on the river, uh, train for six hours, uh, get back, um, have lunch, a late lunch, um, then go into the lab, and work till eight o'clock, eat some something, some excuse for a dinner, and go to bed, and go to bed at eight, <laughs> and get up at six, and that's what he did. That was his life, and it was a complete dedication to both the degree and the thing. So he ended up, you know, rowing in two Olympics, and ended up as a professor uh, at the same time of uh, earth sciences at USC. Yeah. So, uh -huh. Watching, seeing that now, I can't do that. I am not. It's what is extraordinary is that I'm not a very disciplined person. Um, you know, I'm. Uh, you know, I'm. I'm someone that um, I, I'm not a workaholic. I only work when I'm interested in it, um, and then I work extremely hard, of course, and I am intense and disciplined in in those moments. But I'm not disciplined in what I consider the American sense, which means that you're always working. I mean, the American ethic is somehow you always have to be working. And uh, I, I, I'm not like that. And it's, been, it's actually been a bit of a struggle for me because everybody around me seems to be always be working. And I sort of goof off every once in a while. Uh, or I lose interest um, or, or whatever. Um, and, and to see my, our son um, do this for many years, I mean, two Olympics, that's eight, that's eight years, basically. And, uh, and by the way, even when he went to USC, um, he was tempted to take a leave and because they wanted him to row in a third Olympics in, in London, in the London Olympics. And he was going to do it and sort of, I don't know how you can say, semi-commute between Los Angeles and London. <laughs> I mean, obviously you couldn't do it in London, but you know, in terms of trying to keep the two ends of his life going. But after a lot of thought, he decided that was completely nuts, <laughs> which is what I told him. <laughs> yeah. no, but Fathers sometimes but, have good advice. But, 
Yeah, but to see that dedication in one's child is extraordinary because he was, I mean, he didn't, what is interesting is that that was not something that either of us as parents instilled in him, that, that's, that sort of brute sense of discipline, that kind of discipline. We did in terms of the one thing I've always um, um, sort of tried to tell our children and all my students and postdocs is that um, you do have to be disciplined if you're going to succeed in terms of, you know, there are certain things almost like learning your times table. I mean, which kids probably don't do anymore, but you know, there, there are certain things that you just simply have to learn and know like the back of your hand and you have to do those. And it doesn't matter what great thoughts you might have and what great fantasies about what problems you might solve, unless you have the tools at your disposal, you're not going to be able to solve them. And, uh, and that's a lesson of life, I think, in general. And one of the things, I feel like an old fart now, because one of the things I feel is we're losing is some of that. I feel very, very almost Victorian in my way of thinking, but I see that around me. Not that the people, you know, the young people around me are just as smart as young people always are, and uh, they're very accomplished. But I don't get the sense of the same kind of discipline in that sense of learning tech. And part of that is maybe because of the ease of computation that the, the you know, the computer has rightly and wonderfully relieved us of a lot of drudge work. On the other hand, one of the weird things about some of the drudge work, even though it's drudge, it forms a way of thinking in your brain. It forms pathways in your brain. And I feel some of those are sometimes missing. Um, that's purely my own, you know, anecdotal experience. I mean, I may be completely wrong if people actually study that, but that's my own um, feeling um, um, as I see young people today. And certainly the lessons I've learned and uh, what I've tried to instill in younger people, that having this, having this groundwork, so you've got to build on something. You can't just go in, you can't just decide you're gonna solve, you know, um, the meaning of life without sort of living some of it and learning some of the features of life, so to speak. Yeah, Jeffrey, this is really interesting. I I'd love to hear your articulation on how you view potential second and third order consequences of this. Um, you mentioned just the overall ease of computation now, and if there's the lack of discipline early, what do you think like this should look like moving forward then? Well, uh, I think it's coupled also with something, another phenomenon which, you know, is all very familiar with, and that is the pressure to be not just specialized, but to kind of be specialized, specialized. I mean, that we all have to be a uh, you know, you have to be an expert in one very specific thing. I mean, and that's the, the way one succeeds. Uh, the reward system uh, in, um, in academia, which is what I'm most familiar with, of course, is very much that way. But my impression is in the business and corporate world, it's quite similar that, uh, you know, you have to have something associated with your name that's very special. Um, and the big picture and thinking broadly, um, even though most people, I think most people that are interested in ideas have that in their younger years, that sort of gets beaten out of them in terms of the, um, the reward system. And uh, that coupled with this kind of um, re release from having to know some things because I can Google immediately. I can go on Wikipedia and get some, you know, some semblance of what the idea is I'm thinking about or the, the, the answer to some simple problem. Or, uh, you know, I can do some calculation. You know, it, it reminds me of uh, years ago when um, calculators started to come in first. So this is, you know, it's hard to believe it's not so long ago, you know, that the first sort of handheld calculator, let alone an iPhone, <laughs> came in. Um, but, you know, you, you go to a store and uh, 
you know, something would cost uh, um, uh, 98 cents. And in those days, we still use real money, of course, we used the paper, you give them a dollar, and the young person at the, uh, at the register would then have to work out on the register, a dollar minus 98 <laughs> is two cents before and I they give me the two, you know, not not being able to calculate, I mean, which was astonishing to me. I mean, I maybe I'm slightly exaggerating, but not by much. And that became more and more common. Well, okay. Okay, you don't really need that, obviously. Um, but, you know, there's a way of thinking that that engenders. And that's the point, being able to subtract maybe two from 100, yes, but being able to subtract 14.5 from 100 is actually a useful way of thinking, you know, to better do that. And so losing that across the whole spectrum of things that computers and uh, have allowed us, this, this laptop has allowed me to do, um, makes one, it, it, it potentially introduces lazy thinking, I think. Now, I may be wrong in that because it also gives you this incredible power. I mean, absolutely extraordinary power to do other things. So there's clearly trade-off. And, um, but my concern is um, more and more we're gonna lose uh, the power of understanding things conceptually, the idea that there are principles involved, um, that there are generic ideas and so on. And, and the latest version of that, of course, is AI, which of course is fantastic. I mean, it's gonna do some marvelous things, but it means in a certain sense, if I may be exaggerating, you don't have to understand it. It's just there and the, you know, just say that's in the data and you turn the crank and out comes a solution kind of thing. You know, this is what you have to do to stop, uh, to, to reverse global warming. This is what you have to do to not have a pandemic. Put in the data, turn the crank and everything comes. Wow, well, that's good. I'm, kind of nuts, of course. Uh, but in many things, that kind of shoving in the data and turning the crank, with some, you know, other bells and whistles, um, is extraordinarily powerful. So yes, let's, let's exploit it, and we are, and it will do wonderful things. But let's be very careful that we don't destroy, you know, several hundred years of analytic conceptual thinking and ways of thinking. Um, so that, that's what I'm concerned about. Now that may not happen, but that's my concern. Well, I, I'm really intrigued to hear even you articulate a little, little bit more about your useful ways of thinking. And correct me if I'm wrong here, I, I've kind of taken you to be a, a very good first principles thinker. And I would love when you come across something new, a new topic you're gonna explore, what does that process look like for you? Oh boy, <laughs> let's see. Well, first of all, you know, is that, you know, I'm a physicist, a theoretical physicist, and <clears throat> physics <clears throat> is maybe the quintessential example, of course, of, of analytic thinking, or at least um, the way a, a, a paradigm or a structure for attacking a problem. And um, it, it, it has several features which are um, powerful and important. One is, first of all, um, not to be overwhelmed by the details and to think through, and this is hard, of course, um, what are the essential features and the essential variables, um, the essential drivers of what's going on? Um, you know, so first of all, trying to isolate that. And then I think the second part of it is to put that in, in both in, for want of a better phrase, I'll put mechanistic terms. You know, what is, where, where is, where, if anywhere, is cause and effect here? What is, what is prime? What is primary here? What is secondary? And thirdly, is to put that into a quantitative form. And when, and especially you asked about beginning a problem, and that is, you know, just in general terms. Um, what is, so for example, my migration from um, high energy physics into biology came about for a bunch of obscure reasons, but the question that I asked myself 
was the, the question I got interested in was about um, aging and mortality. And um, so of course, one's interested in what is the mechanism by which one ages. Um, but the, the question going to this third part, the quantitative part was to ask the question, what sets the scale of a hundred years? Why is it that, you know, you and I are destined to live of the order of a hundred years? You know, you're not gonna live, uh, you know, hopefully uh, you'll live to close to that, but you're not gonna live much more than that. Doesn't matter what human being you are, it doesn't matter how good the medicine and healthcare is. You know, um, the oldest living person ever was 122. Um, and that was extreme. So, um, you're not going to, so where does that number come from? Why can't you live for 500 years or 5,000 years? So, so asking those kinds of questions um, are, are sort of the, the framework that I um, initiate in thinking about problems is, first of all, as I say, just going back to ask what are the essential features like in this one, you asked about aging. Well, you say, you know, the first thing you think of, well, what does that mean, aging and death? That means you had a system that was working just fine, and then it starts to degrade. Something starts to go wrong, and then it goes so wrong that the thing just stops. So obviously, one of the big questions is, what the hell was keeping it going in the first place? So that for us is metabolism. So you better ask yourself about metabolism. So there, it's that kind of thinking. Um, and then to ask, you know, what are the essential features of metabolism? Um, and so on and so forth. And that's, that's sort of a physicist way of attacking problems. I, I, believe me, I want to dive into scale here in a second. One more quick nuanced question here. As you're exploring these ideas, are, are you writing these out by hand? Or are you just kind of exploring these ideas in your head? Well, I would say the following. If I were giving advice to anybody, I would say you should keep a notebook and you should write down these thoughts as you're going. And I would say most of my colleagues, including my children or my wife, do that. Or my colleagues and post on. I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of lazy in a way. I don't know what it is, but I keep it all in my head and I keep going back to it. I do, obviously, occasionally I write something down because I have to work something out. Um, you know, there's the calculation that needs to be done. And um, uh, so, and at some stage, obviously I do, because eventually it becomes a serious, um, a serious problem. That is the problem, my God, this is an interesting problem. I can work it out. I can solve it. Um, and, uh, you know, I've talked to other people maybe about it. We collaborate and eventually a paper is written. So at some stage, certainly, I start writing stuff, but I don't do it in a systematic way, keeping a notebook. You know, if you're an experimental scientist, it is, what is the word, de rigueur, you have to keep a notebook. You keep a notebook of every detail of what's going on, much like a doctor does with a patient. Yeah, and, and I think that's very good practice. And I must say, um, you, you sort of touch a slight nerve here because I've always felt that's a failing of myself, that I wasn't more rigorous. And it goes, by the way, back to this discipline question, I'm not sufficiently, I've not been sufficiently disciplined um, to, to do that in a way that, that um, I can go back and look and so forth. Uh, but as I say, at some stage, I do do that, obviously. Otherwise, I would I'd never write a paper. <laughs> I'd never yeah. get anything finished. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, yes. Um, uh, but I would, I would say that's something one should do. You mentioned you'll, you'll talk to other people in your field uh, to challenge your thinking. It's something I try to do often. Who throughout your career is the best at challenging your thinking? Ooh. Is that the question? You mean yeah, maybe name names? <laughs> well, you, I mean, even even if you, if you if you if you would, that'd be fantastic. If not, though, I'm wondering well, what are they doing? What type of questions are they asking of you to, to help you explore well, your thinking? You know, it, it varied. Uh, it's varied throughout my career. Of course, when you're young, you have uh, you know a thesis advisor or a mentor, and I was 
fortunate in having some outstanding physicists as my mentors who less that they challenged my thinking than they provided, um, how should I say, role models for how you should think and thinking in sort of these bigger terms and thinking conceptually and um, uh, two or three of them. So I can tell you who they are. My, when I was an undergraduate, my, uh, one of my tutors was a man named Neville Mott, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine Physics. Um, and, um, he, and then when I was a graduate student, uh, my thesis advisor was a man named Leonard Schiff, who wrote a, a standard text on quantum mechanics at that time. Um, and um, then when I was a postdoc, I wasn't exactly my mentor, it was partially my mentor, a man named Vicky Weisskopf at MIT. Um, and all three always wanted to think big, and they all said pretty much the same thing. They presented what is really the arrogance of physics, that you should be able to work on any problem. That's what you're being trained for. You know, just any problem, you ought to be able to think through how to attack it, to set it up so that it could be solved or at least attempted to be solved and so on. So they were extremely important. So it was less that they challenged me. The challenge was, of course, that I didn't think in those terms. You know, I mean, I just thought I was still thinking as most students do in solving problem sets. You're given a problem, here it is solve it and you know you know in electricity and magnetism or in mechanics or quantum mechanics you just solve you know some are hard and some not but here i think and here's the important point yes is that also what i learned from them and whether they said it explicitly or not i don't know but certainly by sort of osmosis was equally important is to ask the right question and uh, that took me a long time to really understand you know, it's, it's the question sometimes as much as the solution that is important. And um, I think in that way, they, I was challenged, even if it wasn't explicitly. But later, of course, in terms of collaborations, I collaborated, I, most of the work in my early career was done on my own, but I collaborated with, with some wonderful people. Uh, but um, I would say that my best collaborations were um, in high energy physics was a man named Stuart Riley, who is at Ohio State now. Um, that was wonderful. We had some, uh, we did one piece of work that uh, we were super excited about to do with dark matter and something called the solar neutrino problem that we realized one day that if it were right, we'd get the Nobel Prize. But it wasn't in the end. <laughs> 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 it wasn't. It was great. It was a wonderful piece of work. But, you know, that's, that's one of the hard things about being a scientist, often, I think, is you can come up with it, what you think is a great idea. And, um, you know, you, what you do is correct. But that's not the way nature works. Right. You know, and you have to accept that. And that's hard because you've spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of emotion sometimes and it doesn't work. Um, but later, when I switched, uh, you know, this, this move into biology, um, the, the collaboration with uh, James Brown, Jim Brown, who was the, his uh, very well-known ecologist, basically, um, was fantastic. And that, that led me to all the work that to do with scale and uh, scaling in general and so forth. And uh, he was fantastic. And that was, um, that was challenging in a very different way because Jim was, is an outstanding scientist. He thinks, uh, he's, he thinks conceptually, he thinks in big, big picture terms. He's interested in big questions, um, but he's mathematically challenged relative to a physicist. Obviously he's a biologist, it's not, it's not his training. And, uh, and I, on the other hand, um, you know, I, I have, um, you know, this tool set of mathematics and physics, 
but I knew no virtually no biology. And so that challenge, of, there the challenge was of bringing these two different ways of attacking fundamental questions together in a collaborative way. And that was incredibly challenging um, because, um, you know, um, I had to learn to put what is, what may be thought of as what sophisticated mathematical derivations into English, so to speak, you know, you know, to explain in very simple mathematical terms uh, what the sophisticated mathematics was saying and to really get to the heart of it. And that's an enormous challenge. And by the way, it was that experience of doing that but this is what led to the work that the, the, the work that we accomplished, which I think was a tremendous contribution, but more so really to be able to write this book, which is has a, a book which I wrote um, about many things across the spectrum of science, uh, many of which rely on detailed and sophisticated mathematical derivations and to write it without a single equation. <laughs> and, but not, um, but addressing the underlying reason for why it works. That is not just pulling things out of the hat and saying, this is why the mathematics worked and trying to explain in English why it worked. And it came from that experience, that challenge of just writing down equations, which is what we do, you know, in physics, we're, you know, we're, we're all trained in similar ways. We write down equations and we de derive things together and you don't have to explain, you know, of course, what this you know, means underneath. Uh, we all understand that. And uh, sometimes we don't, by the way, and sometimes that's what leads to great breakthroughs is that you've deluded yourself because we all agree, you know, we're all sort of, take it for granted. And then you suddenly realize, oh my God, you realize we actually assume this, that's obviously not right. So that's, it's a very useful exercise, but this was it in the, in the extreme. And, and I think it was because of that, that we were so successful in our collaboration in the end, in, despite the fact that it was incredibly frustrating at times. And I would sometimes come home quite frustrated and angry and say, what am I doing, wasting my time? You know, these guys don't understand simple equations. That was at the beginning. But it was dedicated. I, I should say, by the way, I used to say, this is like a marriage, you know, <laughs> or a relationship, a deep relationship, where you get pissed off at the other person, and you, but you're committed. And you know that you, that you love them, but they love you. Well, you two definitely, executed your job correctly because I was I was even preparing for this conversation and just thinking about that and you want to talk about mathematically challenged believe me I fit the mold there and your book it, it's funny I always can kind of judge how much I enjoy the book um, by how I purchase them how much I, I underline so I've got the the hard copy which I'm obsessed with I have the Kindle and then I have the audio so if oh. I do the trifecta in a book you know I'm obsessed with it and, and yours the simplicity in terms of what you take as some of the the biggest most difficult things you could imagine um, to consolidate for, for anyone to understand. I would love to dive into the book scale. I would love if you could define scale first, because I think that'll set a good foundation. Sure. Well, scale of itself is extremely simple. In fact, it's deceptively simple. Um, scaling simply is really sort of ask the question, um, you know, if I have a system, or, you know, some, some uh, object, uh, what happens if I scale it up in size? What changes? I mean, so everything from, you know, um, uh, you know, some simple object lying on your desk to this computer. What happens if I try to scale up this laptop to uh, double its size, 10 times its size, 100 times its size? Is that possible? And what happens? And in particular, you know, um, what happens if you have a living system, us, um, what happens if you make it a hundred times bigger? What happens, you know, it sounds sort of simple in a way, and it turns out that is underlies much of science, that uh, they are trying to answer that question. How do things change when you change the scale of the system is, um, you know, is a fundamental question. I mean, even so, by the way, 
to the universe itself, because you could think of the universe from the Big Bang as a scaling phenomenon. It started out infinitesimally small and it just scaled up. And, uh, you know, if you understood everything, uh, you would discover that as you scaled up with uh, the universe being in that little tiny infinitesimal object with all its various components, what you would eventually get are galaxies and planets and life and then you and me talking. That's what you would, <laughs> I mean, that would right now. <laughs> I mean, a little, obviously a cartoon version of it, but that's the point. It's sort of buried in that question, these huge consequences. So you set out to answer the question, what sets the scale of human lifetime in a hundred years? Yes. And I would love for you just even, even dive into what your exploration found there. Yeah, so it started out that way um, uh, for a number of reasons, but I got sort of interested in that question, um, what sets the scale of life in 100 years? And then, as I said earlier, it became very clear that one, um, in order to answer that question, one has to ask the question, what is it that's keeping the system alive? What's keeping us alive? And what's going wrong? You know, what, what goes wrong with that system? So what keeps us alive is metabolism, meaning that we eat, we metabolize, so to speak, we digest the food and send energy through to the cells. And that's the system we have, basically, um, in, in its simplest form. And, um, uh, and so when I started thinking about it, I started, I learned something extraordinary um, because um, that, um, Early on in biology in the 1930s, a man named Max Kleiber had um, systematized some data on metabolic rate, which means, roughly speaking, how much food you need each day to stay alive. And what he had discovered, if he plotted um, the metabolic rate versus the size of an organism, now he's looking across multiple organisms, um, that um, he found a very simple result. Now, this was very surprising, and I'll say what the simple result is in a moment, but um, he found um, it was surprising because uh, after all, we believe in natural selection, we believe in evolution by natural selection, meaning that um, not only does the entire body, but every subsystem, every organ, every cell type, every genome in your body has its own unique evolutionary history, everything is, historically contingent. And it's all happened by these random processes, survival of the fittest and all the rest of the stuff. And so, you know, it's it has built into it at the most naive level, sort of the, a kind of chaotic randomness. Therefore, you would have expected naively at the most naive level, if you plotted something like metabolic rate of organisms from, you know, a, a, a mouse to a whale, um, on a graph versus their size, the points would lie, not exactly randomly, but they'd be distributed all across the piece of graph paper you were plotting them on. And what Kleiber discovered was that it wasn't like that at all. They lined up on a, on a simple line, a simple curve, actually a simple line, if he plotted them um, in order to get them on the graph paper, going up by factors of 10, so-called plotting them logarithmically. That is, instead of plotting you know, the weight one, two, three, four, five grams. You plotted one gram, 10 grams, 100 grams, 1,000 grams, because if you plotted them one, two, three, and you wanted to get a mouse and a whale on the same piece of graph paper, you'd have to go many miles away. <laughs> because a, a whale is 100 million times more massive than a, <laughs> a mouse, or at least a shrew, anyway. So the point was, the point of this is that you saw this unbelievable simplicity um, in the extraordinary complexity of life. I mean, metabolism is maybe the most complex phenomenon in the universe. That is, you take stuff and you make life out of it. That's what metabolism sort of naively does. So, um, so the other thing that he discovered was the slope of this line when plotted in this logarithmic way was very, very close to the number three quarters, which was also weird. Um, now, subsequently, um, with um, the, the uh, analysis of 
billions and billions of data, basically. Um, people plotted all physiological variables, you know, heart rates and lengths of aorta and diffusion rates of various things across membranes and so on, all kinds of things that you can measure. Uh, life history events, like how long does it take to mature, how long you live and so on, all these various things. And they all showed the same thing. They all had a similar simplicity in how they scale. And not only that, the slopes of all these lines was always a simple multiple of one quarter. So metabolic rate had the slope plotted this way of three quarters. Heart rate had a slope of minus one quarter, the minus meaning the bigger you are, the slower the heart rate actually, um, and so on. And lifespan um, seemed to scale with a slope close to one quarter. So there was this weird thing, and there were maybe 50, 75 of such graphs, but they all seem to have this one quarter built into them. So this number four seemed to play a determinant role in the structure of life on the planet. And that is extraordinary. And that was, that, that, that's called quarter power or allometric scaling. And that was a big mystery. And I sort of stumbled across this in thinking about aging because lifespan and met metabolic, rate, metabolic rate both had these properties. And so the question was, where in the hell does this come from? Because if you could understand where it came from, um, what, then maybe you could understand uh, something about aging and lifespan and understand where this 100 years came from. So that was my sort of eventually my strategy. And so I started working on that. And the first thing you realize is, and I didn't say this, that um, the scaling laws are for all organisms. It's not just mammals, but it's also true for insects, uh, birds, fish, crustacea, plants, trees, whatever. They all have their, in other words, in of their sort of engineering structure, they all seem to obey the same scaling law. That's pretty weird because we're not a tree. <laughs> you know, we, we move around. We, I mean, obviously we're not a tree. Um, yet we satisfy the same scaling law. It, it was quite extraordinary. So there, whatever the underlying reason for this, it has to transcend the evolved design, the evolved engineered design that we had. And so what that led me to realize was the thing that underlies this is something that's, that's generic to all of life. And just to jump ahead, all of life, including so, our social life, um, and that is networks, that it must be something to do with the mathematics and physics of networks because all of these systems have one thing truly in common, and that is they distribute energy and information via networks. Not only that, these networks tend to be hierarchical, like your circulatory system goes from your heart all the way down to capillaries and so on, or your brain, if you look at your brain, it has a similar kind of structure. So to, now to cut a very long story short, that taking that idea, thinking about some general properties of networks, working with Jim and Brian Enquist, who's now himself a well-known biologist, um, we worked everything out and we were able to derive. Can you hear me? I, my, it said it got unstable. Yeah, you, you broke up for one second, um, but yeah. Yeah, it you, does you, that. Yeah, I, I have very, it's been terrible lately. I'm, I'm, I should have warned you of that at the beginning. But, but anyway, so we, we were able to derive the origin of the scaling laws, and in particular, the origin of the number four um, for uh, these uh, for you know, different forms of uh, life. And uh, that was published in a series of papers in the 90s. And um, we went on in various forms to extend it to, in terms of its ramifications to so things like growth, can you take this idea? Now you have a theory. This is one of the great things about sort of a physics way of thinking. You have a theory, it's quantified, it's mathematized, 
and it has it relies on general principles those general principles were to do with the networks you take those and you apply it to different kinds of situations one of those being growth what what it, how did its growth determined well that was rather simple in this framework you metabolize what happens to that energy it gets when it goes to the cells it gets allocated between maintenance it repairs damage and replaces cells that have died and then it grows new ones so you have to put that into mathematics and that's all controlled by the flow through the networks so you put that in mathematics and amazingly out of all that came you know understanding of growth curves and in particular why it is we stop growing because it's pretty weird when you think about it you eat voraciously when you're little and you grow quickly very fast almost exponentially uh, and then gradually you stop by the time you're you know 17 18 if you're a human being you basically stop and even though you keep on eating you don't grow, I mean, you may get a little fatter and so on, but what's called ontogenetically, you don't grow. You stay pretty stable and then you die. <laughs> and why is that? Why is it that suddenly, you know, now, you, you know, the pat answer would be, might be, well, the genes turn it off. Turns out you don't need genes. This does it. It's the, the theory of the networks does it for you. It, uh, and so it's a very nice thing that does it for all organisms. And so that was very successful. Then we applied it to things like um, sleep. Interesting question. Why do we sleep? Why is it we have to sleep of order eight hours? And one of the things I did not know till I started thinking about it, I didn't know that a mouse has to sleep for anywhere from 16 to 17 hours a day, whereas an elephant only sleeps three or four and a whale only two, pretty amazing. And you think, where, what, you know, where did all that come from? Well, we worked all that out. Um, but by the way, I, let me just expand on that because there's something I meant to say about the scaling of metabolic rate. If metabolic rate increase, one of the things about this three quarters scaling law, that is called technically sublinear scaling and if it were linear scaling, it would say, if I double the size, I would need twice as much energy, which is at the most naive level, what you would expect. If I get twice as big, I have twice as many cells, I need twice as much energy, obviously. No, it's not true. You actually only need 75% more energy is what the scaling law says. And it says that's because of the efficiency of the network. So the bigger you are, the more efficient you become, meaning the less energy is needed to support each cell. So each cell is working less hard in you than it is in your dog or cat, but your horse's cells are working less hard than you, or yours. Um, and this goes directly to both lifespan and sleep because if your cells are working less hard, they're creating less damage. They're, they're not working as hard. The engine is turning over much more slowly. Um, so it can live longer. So you live longer. And in fact, that's the origin in the end of why big things live longer. The origin of the scaling law for, for sleep. And if you work it through to give you an idea of why it is it might be of order 100 years why, for, for our lifespan. Contrary to that, you can argue about why sleep um, goes the other. sleep is weird because almost all time scales in biology um, increase the bigger you are. You live longer, things take longer to develop, and so on. Everything slows down. The bigger you are, everything slows down in a systematic, calculable, predictable way governed by the dynamics of these networks. Um, but one of the weird things is that sleep is one of the time scales that goes in the opposite direction. The bigger you are, the less sleep you need. So why is that? What, what's going on here? And the, the point is that you recognize the following. So you have to first of all have an idea, why do we sleep? So that is to do with our brains. Because, you know, I said a moment ago, the, the reason from this viewpoint, the reason you age and die 
is your cells are working and they're creating damage. And it's that damage, that eventual accumulation of damage, even though you do repair yourself, but you, you, you I mean, you cannot repair yourself faithfully. It, it's too expensive, so to speak, to repair yourself precisely. <laughs> so gradually the system degrades. And that's the basis of the theory of aging and mortality. But um, uh, the one organ that better not degrade very much at all is your brain. Because if you, sure enough, as you think, and you operate during your daylight hours, so to speak, um, you're creating damage in your brain. And if you didn't repair that faithfully, within a very short time, you would not be you. Um, your brain would be sufficiently damaged that you would um, uh, become demented or whatever, you'd be something else. So built into your brain is uh, you have to uh, repair faithfully. So the number of damages, the number of repair mechanisms equals the number of damages that have occurred, roughly speaking, so that the system remains pretty um, um, integrated. And um, of course, you're also spending energy processing. So, um, so, so what is interesting about that then is that um, uh, if you do that, then um, of course, the, the amount of energy that you're putting into your, that's why, oh, by the way, that's why of all your organs in the body, your brain per unit mass spends much more of your metabolism is going to your brain than it is per gram of tissue in the rest of your body. You're spending a huge amount, relatively speaking, you're spending much more energy keeping your brain in this sort of integrated state, in this uh, repaired state. So um, if you take that idea, then um, uh, what you learn is, of course, that um, the bigger you are, um, the, the, the less energy is needed to keep this repair going because there's uh, this, this three-quarter power scaling law. So that um, uh, from that, you can derive um, the, an interesting scaling law for sleep and see why it is that elephants only sleep for, only need to sleep for a couple of hours and uh, whereas a mouse needs to sleep for 16. So there's all of these kinds of things that follow from um, once you have a theory that um, explains the origins of, the, of metabolic scaling. And by the way, it also explains um, the, the, not just the scaling between organisms, but how you scale within yourself. That is, you know, how you go from the aorta down through your circulatory system, for instance, to the capillaries, how that system scales of itself. So it, it's, a, it's a very powerful theoretical framework. That system very similar to a tree, correct? So yes. Yeah. So one of the other things that we did was apply that to trees. And that's a, that, that was, of course, an interesting challenge because um, it goes to what I said earlier. We're not trees. We look like trees. In fact, inside, you know, if you take yeah. our circulatory system, of course, superficially, it looks like a tree. And it is very similar to a tree. But it is, it is different physically because you are, your circulatory system is a bunch of pipes like you know, the plumbing in your house. But, your, but a tree is a bunch of fibers joined together. It's a fiber bundle, a bundle of fibers joined together, like an electrical, you know, electrical cable. If you take a thick electrical cable, it's got a bunch of mm -hmm. in, cables inside. Well, that's what a tree is. It's got uh, I mean, a plant. The plants and trees are the same, of course. They, but they have this fiber, uh, this fiber bundle. And, and as they branch out, it's just branching, those fibers just branch out, you know, some, some at the end go all the way from a branch that's distant all the way basically down to the roots. And, uh, so, um, so it's quite different. And yet it satisfies the same scaling laws. And that's because the underlying principles of the network are the same. 
And so we had to work all that out. That's all worked out. And that was, that was very nice to understand uh, how plants and trees work. And then to apply it to an entire forest. You know, the, the forest as almost like a super organism. How does it work? Made up of trees of different sizes and so on. And that, that, was, that was really delightful. That was very enjoyable to see how all that worked and then to compare it to data. This is, of course, a crucial part of being a scientist. Compare it to the data and see that, my God, all the predictions of the theory are um, uh, uh, shown by the uh, data in forests across the globe. So that was very nice. And, yeah. and also, just to tie it together, that even though we're different than plants, nevertheless, uh, the same principles apply at the network level. So much here. I, I, this is why I love the book. All of this is just so fascinating to me. I would love if you could hit on real quick, though, uh, just around the scaling laws in terms of how they differ in, in cities as opposed to biology. Yes. This, is, this is just yes. fascinating. So this was, yes. Yeah, so it was, yeah. So after we did a lot of this work, some of which I just talked about, um, it was natural, of course, to ask, you know, can we expand this to, uh, and in particular to social organizations, very natural to think of, you know, is it, is to what extent are cities, for example, or companies um, like organisms? And in fact, you know, there's a long history, of course, of people discussing um, companies and cities and often uh, biological lifelike uh, metaphors are used, you know, the DNA of a company and the ecology of the marketplace and so on, um, metabolism of the city. So it's used, um, but um, so, but it was very natural to do that. And so um, uh, I formed a different collaboration, a different set of people um, from some of from, from the social sciences and some uh, from urban studies and so on to start thinking about this. Um, and uh, the first thing we had to do was to ask the question that was that had already been answered for us in biology. Because in biology, by when I started thinking about it, as I had mentioned, much of the data on scaling itself had been analyzed um, and uh, previously, you know, the quarter power scaling had been known and so on. So all this was known. Um, but uh, when it came to cities, there wasn't, there basically wasn't any. People hadn't thought in these terms at all. So going back to the biology, one of the, so what did we learn? We learned that despite the fact that the whale lives in the ocean, the giraffe has a long neck, elephant a trunk, we work on two feet and the mouse scurries around, actually, to sort of the 80 to 90% level, we're actually scaled versions of each other. I mean, was there any, in terms of anything that you could measure, you measure anything about our physiology or our life histories, we're actually scaled versions of one another. So in that sense, just to ram that point home, there's one idealized mammal and every single mammal that has existed on this planet is just a variant of that one mammal. It's a scaled version of that mammal. That's what, that's what it's those scaling laws say. And it's because we have the same underlying dynamics and geometry of networks. Question, is that true of cities? That is, is New York a scaled up Los Angeles, which is a scaled up Chicago, which is a scaled up Santa Fe, which is where I live, even though they have different histories, geographies, and even different cultures. And um, well, you know, uh, they certainly look differently, but on the other hand, they obviously have great similarities. I mean, they're all places where people live. <laughs> they're, they all have roads and houses and buildings and, you know, all the rest of it, electrical lines. So they all have similar things. They're all trying to do similar things. Um, and most importantly, from our viewpoint, they're all networks, obviously. I mean, uh, transport networks and resource networks and social networks and so on. So, uh, but the first thing was to gather data and see to what extent 
the our cities indeed scale versions of one another. So um, this, this marvelous group of young people that uh, work with me put all that together and uh, we discovered all these wonderful scaling laws. And, uh, and, and they were very illuminating because the first sort of scaling laws were to do with infrastructure, which is the way you normally think about a city. You normally think of the city just as the buildings and roads and so on and the rest of it. And what we discovered was that it was just like biology, that um, they scaled in the same mathematical way as biology. That is, if you plotted them in this logarithmic way, going up by factors of 10, um, in, in population, population was taken as the size of a city. But if you go by factors of 10, then um, infrastructure, for example, the number of gasoline stations or the length of all the roads as plotted against the population size looked just like it did in biology, plotted in this logarithmic way. It was a straight line. The only difference was that the slope of the line, instead of being 0.75 for three quarters was closer to 0.85. But otherwise it looked the same. Even more amazing was that it didn't matter what infrastructure it was. Any infrastructure always scaled with the same slope of 0.85. And even more surprising was it didn't matter where you looked in the world. That is, we, we looked at data, of course, in the United States, in Europe, in Latin America, in uh, Asia, China, Japan all look pretty much the same with the same slope of 0.85. And so it was very much like biology. It had a sort of universality transcending history, geography, and culture. Um, and it had this economy of scale, which I probably didn't emphasize enough about biology. But in biology, I said earlier, the bigger you are, the less per cell is needed to stay alive um, by 25%. You save 25%, roughly speaking, with each doubling of size in biology. So here in cities, it was that um, with each doubling of size, you don't save 25%, you save 15%. So, but nevertheless, it looked just like biology. So that was interesting. But what was really interesting and really exciting was when we looked at what a city is really about, and that is its socioeconomic activity, and that is looking at um, things like uh, wages in a city, uh, the uh, number of patents produced in a city, meaning it's sort of its innovative uh, strength, um, the amount of crime in a city, which is also innovative by the way, of course, crime, disease, and so on. All the various things that you could find data on associated with cities, uh, we um, analyzed and we discovered to our great satisfaction, they scaled mathematically in the, exactly the same way, except it had a new feature. And that was, first of all, the slope was not 0.85 as it was for infrastructure. It was 1.15. It was bigger than one. First time we saw something that we called super linear, bigger than one, which meant the opposite effect to the economy of scale. So an economy of scale, the bigger you are, the less you need per capita, less roads per capita, less gas stations per capita, the less electrical lines per capita. But now it says the bigger you are, the higher the wages are per capita, uh, the more patents there are per capita, the more innovative you are per capita, the more disease per capita, the more crime per capita, the more schools per capita, the more restaurants per capita, anything with socioeconomic activity regardless of whether it was good, bad, or ugly, <laughs> it scaled in the same way. And it did it, as far as we could tell, across the globe. So this was fantastic. And we quickly realized, which we'd already guessed beforehand, and in fact, we'd actually written in our proposals, was that this was all to do with the universality of social networks. That underlying all this um, is the, the, the universality of the way people interact with each other, talk to one another, form groups with each other, and so on. Because that's pretty much the same across the globe. It's sort of built into our social DNA, so to speak, that we are who we are as human beings, 
in the way we interact. And that also leads to the idea that what the city is, is really a um, cauldron, an incubator, it's a facilitator of social interactions. That's what the city is. And in that sense, it's the most marvelous machine we have ever built. Because what it does, it brings people together in order to exchange ideas, interact, exchange ideas, most of which are pointless and useless to almost everybody else. But every once in a while, doing that, that dynamic produces the theory of relativity. Mm -hmm or quantum mechanics, or a Google, or a Microsoft, or an Amazon. That's what it does. That's where it comes from, that phenomenon. And so that's the machine that does it. That is, you would not have a, uh, you know, quantum mechanics by Heisenberg sitting on a mountain all alone for 50 years, and, or well, he did it at age 26, for 26 years, and coming up with that. Or you wouldn't have Jeff Bezos sitting in a mountain in Albania, um, uh, coming up with this idea of um, Amazon, for example. It has to be within the social net, obviously. That's who we are. And the city is the machine that facilitates and enhances that. And that's what this data was sort of saying. And we, um, so one of the ways we tested this with some colleagues at MIT was um, we realized that you know, one of the predictions from this is if you could measure social interaction, the degree of social interactions, the number of social interactions as a function of city size, it should scale in the same way as all these socioeconomic quantities. That is, it should have this 15% addition with every doubling. It should this, the, 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 the slope of the scaling line should be 1.15. And uh, we did it with our colleagues at MIT who had access to um, billions and billions of data on cell phone interactions, cell phone, actually both landline and cell phone, but mostly cell phone. And uh, so this was really big data stuff. And when we analyzed those, to using those as a proxy for people interacting with each other, it turned out it agreed perfectly. <laughs> that was very satisfying. Yeah, oh, I imagine. So, so um, now, one of the things that is still, the work is still very much in progress. Uh, we have not really been able to derive the 1.15 to the same degree that we could derive the 1.25, I mean, the, the 0.75, three quarters, the one quarter in biology, which is a nice more defined package. Um, here, it's much hard, been much harder. And the problem here is that in fact, cities are more complicated than biology because they are the interface between um, infrastructure, the physicality of the city um, and the, the flows in sort of infrastructural networks and the flows, the information flows in social networks. Mm -hmm. And the two have to be tied together so, you know, I don't know if you're familiar, you must be familiar with pictures of social networks where they show these nodes of people and then the lines going to their friends and mm -hmm. those friends going to, and it's sort of up there in the clouds somewhere, you know, it's sort of all somehow now become associated with, um, you know, um, social media somehow, social networks. But of course, that's, that is, of course, we do do that. But actually social networks, and in fact, that's what we're doing now. We're in the, obviously, we're not, uh, but social networks primarily and always have been until now, um, we have to be on the, on the ground. In fact, even now, you're not in cyberspace somewhere, you are in some sense, but you're not somewhere up in the cloud, literally. You're sitting in a room, you know, in front of a desk with a computer in front of you, you have to have uh, food around and you have to have a bathroom and so on. Me too. We're tied to this two dimensional surface, whether we like it or not, doesn't matter how sophisticated the cloud is. So it, no matter what, in terms of information flow, you have to join the, the flow of information social network to the physicality of the two dimensional surface on which 
we have to live because of gravitation. We have no choice. So um, that's difficult to put into that. To solve that problem has been very difficult. However, uh, you know, there are, we've, we've made some progress in that and uh, we, we think we understand something about where this 15% comes from. Well, um, well, so, so go ahead, please. No, I was just going to say, well, you're someone who likes solving difficult problems. So it's, it's right up your alley. I have to send you, if you haven't seen it, there's this probably five minute long video. It's called 150 years, I think, of, of research papers. And it, it shows the, the progress of research papers throughout the last 150 years and, and the nodes of the network and how they lead to the next set of research papers. You'll, you'll love this. Oh, that's great. No, I haven't seen that. That's great. No, of course, that's what it is. But that actually is a segue to another aspect of this, which is something that uh, I'm, I'm, has intrigued me and I'm really is the part that now I'm in a certain sense most interested in, and that is the role of time. And you've just described a process that is a time evolution of something. And um, uh, so let me go back to biology a second. One of the things about biology, and I sort of intimated this, is that we, I said, you know, the bigger you are, the less energy per capita, per, per cell, um, that, that economy of scale. But associated with that, which I didn't emphasize, was a slowing down of the pace of life. I sort of indicated that because life gets stretched out. Um, uh, elephants live much longer than uh, mice. Um, and, and, and all time scales get stretched out in a predictable way. Um, the opposite is true in socioeconomic quantities because of the role of social networks. And social networks have in them something that you don't see in biology, and that is positive feedback over short, short periods of time. That is, A talks to B, who talks to C, who talks back to A, and that's how we build up these ideas. You know, is that positive feedback. We build on ideas, as I say, most of which are not very interesting, uh, but that's how we get all our great ideas and all our progress comes about from that, you know, inspired by that kind of dynamic. And, but that also leads to not just more per capita rather than less per capita, but instead of the slowing of the pace of life, the increasing pace of life. And so another kind of prediction from this uh, theoretical structure is that um, the bigger you are, the faster everything goes in a kind of predictable way. And um, we looked at all kinds of data for that. And it's in, um, in very good agreement with that. I mean, one, one we looked at was quite, quite whimsical was this, the, the speed of walking as a function of city size, uh, which was amusing. Yeah, no. <laughs> sort of agree. <laughs> That's a bit of a stretch, but it was, it was kind of amusing to see. But um, much more interesting is that, of course, we feel that, that the pace of life um, in, has been does increase as socioeconomic activity gets more and more, and so on. And certainly, you know, in my own life, my gosh, pace of life now is so much faster. I mean, my goodness me. I mean, and having to keep up with change. I mean, uh, the fact that you know I still operate with an iPhone six, uh, whereas you know most of the people around me, including my children, have iPhone elevens and so on. And they have, uh, and, and they all were ribbing me yesterday because I don't have an eye watch, you know, and, uh, and so on. Well, this is a trivial example, but, you know, uh, not only an eye watch, but I don't have, you know, I said, well, if I got an eye watch, I get the $199 eye watch two or whatever it is. Oh, you got to get, the, you know, 599 eye watch eight or six or whatever the hell it is. You know, this thing nuts all this thing. Well, this is just an illustration of what, what we live in. Whereas when I was a young man, young, you know, sure things changed, but it was so much slower, oh my God. Um, we just talked earlier. I mean, my God, it wasn't that long ago when I remember the first um, Texas Instruments handheld calculator came in and it was like, well, no, more importantly, was the tech, the one that came in, maybe it was the HP, where you could actually do, write a program. I mean, that was extraordinary. That was like, 
you know, but you know, it took forever for, for when you think about it in terms of modern terms from having computers to that. Now it took nothing. Yeah. Anyway, so this is very important. And uh, one of the th other things that is one th 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 about the theory that was extremely satisfying, as I said earlier, um, when we applied this theory in biology to growth, it um, explained why it is we stop growing. And, and that was, I didn't emphasize this, that's intimately related to the sublinear scaling of metabolic rate, the three quarters, uh, the economy of scale. The economy of scale is the thing that leads to the stability of the system um, after a, a rapid growth phase. And by the way, that plays a very important role uh, systematically for the uh, sustainability of life on the planet, that most things end up being in a relatively stable state, in a sort of meta-stable state, even though things are changing all the time, of course, evolving, but a relatively stable state. And that's why it's been around for a couple of billion years. Now, that paradigm is terrible for our socioeconomic system. I mean, our great discovery of um, capitalism and entrepreneurship coupled with the fantastic exploitation of fossil fuels has led to this extraordinary quality of life that we have. I mean, my God, that's what it's all due to. Um, and that's great, but we're now discovering we're paying a heavy price. And uh, that price may be the end of everything for all we know. But um, uh, nevertheless, that's what it came from. And that paradigm is built, has built into it open-ended growth, not stable growth, uh, stay, I mean, stability, I should say. And so, um, so one of the nice things that came out of this theoretical framework was that the superlinear scaling that is derived from the positive feedback mechanisms in social networks, the superlinear scaling when fed into the growth equation, so to speak, gives rise to super exponential growth, that is, you don't stop growing, you keep growing. And so that was wonderful. That was very consistent. And I was very excited about that because it bothered me. I couldn't figure out how this thing could work, but it worked, it all worked. It was very consistent and it agreed with data, but it had terrible consequences. And the consequences were one, I've already mentioned, the pace of life has to continue to accelerate. Things have to get faster and faster and the second was that the equation for growth had built into it something that is technically called a finite time singularity. And what that means in English is that in some finite time in the future, um, whatever it is you're measuring, the GDP, the number of AIDS cases, I don't know, whatever it is, the amount of crime is going to become infinite, which is completely nuts, of course. Um, and the theory tells you what happens. The theory tells you that uh, it is nuts and the system is going to collapse. It's going to stagnate and collapse. And the question is, how do you get out of it? Well, we know how we get out of it. We have got out of it. It's what you have to do is before you hit this so-called finite time singularity, which may occur in five years, 10 years, 100 years, but it is going to occur in some, quote, finite time, before you hit that, you better make a major change. You better reinvent yourself. You better change the paradigm under which all of this is developing. I mean, because you realize that everything that I, when I say the growth equation, that assumes that, so to speak, the parameters of what's happening are unchanged during that period. You discovered bronze. <laughs> so that sets a kind of bronze age. You discover coal, that sort of sets a whole tone a whole it dominates everything that follows for a certain period you um, invent computers you discover the internet and so these completely then sort of become the dominant paradigm and set the sort of backdrop for everything we do so it's clear to avoid this collapse what we have to do is at some stage before we hit the singularity, we have to reinvent ourselves by changing the paradigm, by inventing a new paradigm, making a major new innovation. 
And that's what we've done. And if you look at the data, uh, that also agrees with this theoretical framework, both um, qualitatively and quantitatively, in terms of how the speed at which innovations have to come. They have, they have to come faster and faster and faster. And that's what we've done. So, um, you know, the, the economists have, you know, people have been concerned about the sustainability of, of the planet for a long time, um, quite um, over a hundred years, but certainly in the last 50 years, and the two most famous were in the 70s, there was the famous Club of Rome studies about the sustainability of the planet. And then uh, there was a famous book by Paul Ehrlich, an ecologist at Stanford, called The Population Bomb. And of course, previous to that, there was, of course, Malthus, um, who basically said you can't sustain exponential growth. But they all said this, basically. And economists, even beginning back in the 18th, uh, 19th centuries, said, bullshit, of course you can. You know, that's rubbish, and Malthus got crushed, and so on. And so it was when they came back in the 70s, they, the economists uh, said, that's, uh, you know, there's no evidence that uh, where the, the system will not be sustainable. And in particular, uh, you know, the, the, the main thing that you've completely left out, which was completely true, is that you haven't taken into account innovation. We innovate ourselves out of this. And that was true in Malthus's time. He didn't realize, of course, that there were gonna be great innovations in agriculture in response to the demand. And so it was, of course, in, um, to these uh, studies in the 70s. And so economists have this kind of mantra that they sweep all of this under the rug and say, well, we just innovate ourselves out of it every time. And of course we will, and we have. And uh, it, it's, kind of, it's almost like supply and demand. Um, and I agree with that, by the way, that's completely correct. I think that all those previous things were wrong, but there's a price you pay for that. You don't solve the problem by innovating. What you are doing is postponing the problem because you're gonna to have to do it again, they agree, but you're gonna to have to do it faster. So I don't know, you know, just to have a cartoon version, something that might've taken 100 years to develop a thousand years ago, now has to take 15 years and soon it's gonna to have to take 10 and five. So it's kind of loony in a way because you're gonna to have to have an IT revolution sort of every five years or so, which is completely nuts. Um, so that, you know, the thing is gonna build up to something that is truly not sustainable. That's the question. Wow, Je so, Jeffrey West, it's so obvious why, why I love your book, all of your work, your research. Um, the book that, that you wrote that I love is, is Scale. Uh, I do highly recommend it, it it's truly remarkable. Um, I'm hoping at some point you, you and I can connect again and explore some of these ideas. You talked too long. I told you, I warned you, I talked too long. Believe me, I love it. I could go down rabbit holes with you all day. So I, I really can't thank you enough for this. Um, your, your work's impacted me. So I just wanted to say thank you so much uh, for joining us on What Got You There. Thank you. I appreciate it very much, Sean. I enjoyed talking and listening uh, to your questions. But um, would you please let me know uh, when you post it? Sure thing, of course. Excellent. So thank you very much again, and thank you for your interest. Great. Thanks so much. You have a great rest of the day. I'll send this over, and I'll also send the, the research papers as well. Oh, video. yes. Very good. I'd appreciate that very much. Great. Well, you have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much. Same to you. Same to you. What got Bye. you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there uh, with Shonda Laney? What got you there 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 with Shonda Laney?